In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. We'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation this morning. Great to be with you. And as always, uh, we'd like to start off our conversation this uh, morning, inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many, many, many beautiful titles. And uh, among the titles that Mary has, Mary is known as the Mother of God. Mary is the Mother of the Church. And Mary is the Mother of each and every one of us. She's our Mother, our Universal Mother. Also, when we pray that beautiful prayer at the end of the Rosary, the prayer that we call the Hail Holy Queen, we invoke Mary, calling out Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Mary indeed is our life, our sweetness, and our hope, and she's the one that brings us closer and closer to the heart of Christ. So this month of May, which is dedicated to Mary, and as we draw close to the Ascension of our Lord and then Pentecost, let's uh, turn to Mary and ask for her prayers, as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. <laughs> blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to invite to be with us our spiritual director or our spiritual guide. Our spiritual director, or spiritual guide, is of course the Holy Spirit. And uh, there are many titles that are given to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our soul. The Holy Spirit is also known as our Counselor. The Holy Spirit is also known as our Consoler. Related to the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is our intimate friend. The Holy Spirit in us, he is our Sanctifier. Sanctifier means he who makes us holy. The Holy Spirit is also known as the interior master, especially of prayer. As St. Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans. Ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to work in our mind and our hearts. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, a lot of joy, and a lot of love. As we say the prayer of the Holy Spirit, and as we enter into the second day of our novena to the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, Let's pray the classical prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, Grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ.
Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Isidore, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good morning to all of you. So, as is my custom, as we're in our Perseverance family, I promise, as always, that I will pray for you. And I'll pray for you in what is called Opus Dei. Opus Dei, which means the work of God. And I'll pray for you in the greatest of all prayers. The greatest of all prayers, my friends, is the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I have two Masses today, so it'll be a double blessing, a double blessing for all of you. I'll place you on the altar in the Mass. So when I lift up the host and the chalice, which is truly the body and blood of Christ, I'll be lifting you up too. And I'd like to offer three specific intentions. First, as we are in the Novena of Pentecost, we started yesterday, we're honoring in a very special way the Holy Spirit. So I'd pray, like to pray that you would really be open to the Holy Spirit, known as a sanctifier. That you allow the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify you. Allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. Into saints. Remember years ago I was watching a program on TV, Superman. And I remember he grabbed onto a piece of carbon, black piece of carbon coal. And that was black, cold, hard, smelly. And he took it with his hand and he squeezed that piece of coal. And you could see that smoke and steam was rising from his hand. And when he opened up his hand, was no longer a piece of carbon or coal, but it was a beautiful diamond. That image of Superman transforming coal or carbon into a beautiful diamond is symbolic of what the Holy Spirit wants to do us. We're born hard. We're born cold. We're born resistant. We're born with a bad odor. That's called original sin and personal sin. Sin hardens us. It makes us coarse. It makes us resistant. Instead of radiating the fragrance of Christ, the bad odor of sin. But the Holy Spirit is able to transform us into the saints that we're all called to be. 
And as the philosopher says, the biggest tragedy that could befall us is at the end of our lives not to become the saints. Not to become the saints that God has called us to be. So that's my first intention for you. The second, like to pray for your family, for your children, your teenagers, for your family. Especially that your family members would, would go to heaven. Tonight, as well as tomorrow, in most dioceses in the country, we celebrate the solemnity of the Ascension. When Jesus, after 40 days appearing to the apostles, he ascends to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And he'll come to judge the living and the dead. So, I will pray in my Mass that you and your family members will be able to ascend every day in your spiritual lives. You'll be able to grow in that when God calls each and every one of us from this life to the next to be judged, we'll be able to go before the Lord with our name is written in the book of life. The Lord will say, Welcome home, well done, faithful servant. In other words, I, I would like to pray for the conversion, sanctification, and salvation of you and your family members. Now the third intention I'd like to make, and I would not underestimate the importance of this, I'd like to pray that all of you will experience a lot of joy. Yesterday I gave a follow-up talk to the confirmation students, which I'll be doing for the next five weeks. And I talked to them about ten ways that the devil tempts us. Because the devil's out there. Ten ways that the devil tempts us. One of the ways that can easily skip our notice is uh, the devil wants to take away our joy. When we're experiencing interior joy of heart, then the devil flees from us. But in sadness and desolation, that's when not only one devil, but many devils will surround us and tempt us to commit sin and to offend God. So, my friends, those are the... <coughs> Excuse me. My friend, those are the intentions I'd like to offer for you on this uh, beautiful Saturday in the month of May. So, as I mentioned, we are in what is called the Novena now to the Holy Spirit in preparation for Pentecost. Novena, I'm sure most of you know, Novena means nine. And Novena is something that can be very pleasing to God. One of the most famous Novenas is the Novena we make on Good Friday to Divine Mercy. And that culminates on Divine Mercy Sunday. Novena can be made any time, any place. You can make it to Jesus, Mary, or to the saints. But now we're into this Novena, which is, which happened to be the first Novena in the Catholic Church. We go back 2,000 years, 
And before Jesus ascends into heaven, he tells the apostles, the disciples, not to go out to preach right away. But he tells them to first go to the upper room called the Senecal and go with Mary, the mother of God, spending nine days and nine nights in silence, prayer, sacrifice, begging for the gift of gifts, begging for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that was the first novena, and we're in this novena today, 2,000 years later. And the result of that was Pentecost, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit upon Mary and the Apostles in tongues of fire. And we see in them that transformation from the coal to the diamond, especially in Simon Peter, men who ran away from the cross. They were cowards. Once the Holy Spirit comes, we notice a, a real radical transformation. A real radical transformation in these apostles. Yesterday we celebrated St. Matthias, May 14th. And every one of the apostles except St. John They <coughs> ended their lives by martyrdom. What does this idea martyrdom mean? Martyrdom means witness in Greek, in which they gave witness to their Catholic Christian faith by shedding their blood, shedding their blood in imitation of the Master, Jesus Christ. All of us are called to be martyrs, as Pope Pius XII points out. Most of us are probably not called to red martyrdom, the literal shedding of our blood. Once we're confirmed, we used to receive the pat on the cheek, indicating we should be willing to suffer martyrdom for Christ if he so wills it. But there is what is called white martyrdom, Pius XII. And that means dying to ourselves daily. It means carrying our cross daily. It means being patient throughout, throughout our lives. Patient with God, patient with others, even patient with ourselves. So there is the red martyrdom, but also there's the white martyrdom. So this novena, I'll be speaking about the readings for the day, which I'll arrive at shortly. But um, each of these days, I would like to speak about the Holy Spirit to open our minds to a greater understanding of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and his many gifts. So today I'd like to give you a short explanation of one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, just so you're aware, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they come to us. They are gifts. They come to us not first in our confirmation as some people think. Some people think once you're confirmed, you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But rather, the gifts of the Holy Spirit come to us as gifts in the moment of our baptism. We should never, my friends, underestimate 
the graces that flow from the sacrament of baptism. We should be constantly thanking God for the many gifts that he's given to us. But it all started with the sacrament of baptism, in which, related to the Holy Spirit, we became intimate friends with the Holy Spirit and temples of the Holy Spirit. For that reason, St. Paul says, glorify, your God, glorify God in your bodies. Don't you recognize that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? Your great dignity and your great destiny. But also with baptism, with the sacrament of baptism, we've all received the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. How few people understand the working of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Most people don't even know that they exist. Like we're going to meet Apollo, who's preaching, and many people that are, pre that, are, that are receiving his preaching don't even know that the Holy Spirit exists. So part of our perseverance, part of our perseverance family <coughs> conversation is like Apollo in the first reading is that we have to undergo a permanent formation. Yes. Professionals in this country constantly have to work on perfecting themselves as nurses, doctors, teachers, professors, engineers, architects. All have to keep working on what is called their permanent, their permanent professional formation. Even more so, even more so with respect to ourselves and our ongoing spiritual formation. That being said, and the first reading today is very beautiful because this powerful preacher, Apollo, He's intelligent, he's well-educated, he's studious, he's a preacher, he's a teacher, he's anointed, but he's lacking in formation. And I say that that could apply to a lot of us is that we have a lot of gifts, but we're still lacking in a, in a complete formation of our faith. Thanks be to God for this family that we're cultivating, this Perseverance family. So, what about these gifts of the Holy Spirit? What about them? We receive them, as we mentioned, in the moment of our baptism. And these gifts we receive in the moment of our baptism are seven, seven in number. You might try to memorize these gifts and get to know them better and better. As Apollo in the first reading was formed and educated by Priscilla and Aquila, a couple, a friend, uh, two friends of St. Paul that were tent makers. So we should be willing to on a constant basis in our perseverance family to keep growing in the knowledge of our faith. So here are the seven gifts. I'd like to divide them in two categories. And then I'd like to take one and uh, explain it to you. So all of us can beg that this gift of the Holy Spirit will become operative in our lives. Here are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember there are, are seven, which is known to be the number of perfection in the Bible. Now, 
Three of the gifts, this is St. Thomas Aquinas now. This is St. Thomas Aquinas. Three of the gifts serve to perfect our intellect. The other three serve to perfect our will or our heart. And one of the gifts serves as a bridge between mind and heart. Very interesting. So once these gifts are really perfected, our mind becomes purified, more enlightened, more open to God's presence. And then our heart, our soul, is much more open, docile to the working of the Holy Spirit. Consequently, the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier, once we're docile, then he can form us into a saint. Remember that image of Jeremiah in which he takes the clay and he's trying to form the clay into a pot and he recognizes that it wasn't perfect, he had to chip away, then he go back to the to the working of the clay and he was chipping away and finally he finished making the pot. God is the potter and we're the pot. And the Holy Spirit through the gifts has to work on molding us, perfecting us, casting us into the fire, cutting away like the vine and the branches, chipping away the, the parts of the of the clay that should not be there. So I've given you two images, the coal and the diamond. Now it's the clay and the potter. Remember these images. These are images that can be very useful for us in our prayer experience to have a deeper encounter with the Holy Spirit. So, the seven gifts. Here they are. These are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit you're taking notes, it's not a bad idea to write them down. Wisdom. Knowledge. Understanding. Counsel. Fortitude. Piety. Fear of the Lord. I'd like to repeat them again, and hopefully we'll memorize these seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just ask the Holy Spirit to give us a, a better memory. Wisdom. Knowledge. Understanding. Counsel. Fortitude. Piety. Fear of the Lord. So, my friends, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding perfect our intellect. Yes, perfect our intellect. Counsel connects the mind to the heart. And fortitude, piety, and fear, Lord, perfect our heart, our will. Those are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and these gifts are within us. Okay, I'll give you another image. Now, the young people have a saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you are interested in building muscles, you have to get the weights and you have to do the weightlifting. And your arms start to form muscles. If not, you're never going to have muscles. If you want to learn to speak a foreign language, you have to study the language. Otherwise, you're never going to perfect yourself in speaking another language. If you want to learn sports, 
you have to practice the sports. Remember as an, when I was a 13, 14, I practiced throwing the curveball in baseball. So when I pitched my first game in Pony League in New Jersey, <coughs> they actually pitched a no hitter because I was practicing, 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 practicing throwing the curveball. Same image you might use is planting, planting uh, a lawn or grass. If you plant the seed, but you don't water it and cultivate it, the seed is going to die. So, if you don't use it, then you lose it. I repeat, if you don't use it, if you don't use it, then you end up by losing it. The same can be applied of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. If we're not exercising, if we're not exercising these gifts, then these gifts become dormant, latent, so to speak, rusty, inoperative. They have to be exercised. And that's the purpose of this novena that we're making, is we want these gifts to be exercised in our lives. We want these gifts to be operative in our lives. We want these gifts to be brought to fruition by the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, what is the difference between the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the gifts? Very interesting, Thomas Aquinas points out that once we allow the gifts to work in us, these gifts become operative in us, then we experience a certain interior sweetness of our soul. So the interior sweetness of joy and peace and chastity and patience, those wonderful virtues which are called fruits, they blossom and flourish within the tree of our, our soul once we're open to the gifts. So, in one of my homilies yesterday and the Oblate Holy Hour yesterday spoke about the gift of wisdom. Wisdom which is to relish the things of God. We relish, we savor the things of God. The opposite of wisdom would be folly. Then I gave the parable of the rich fool. The rich fool that had an abundant harvest. And his harvest was so abundant that there was no room in his barns. So he decided to tear down his barns and to, big, and to build bigger barns or silos. Then he said to himself, my soul, my soul, you have a long life. You have a long life. Therefore, relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. Relax, live it up, have fun, enjoy life. Jesus says to this man, you are a fool. You are a fool because this very night your life will be taken from you. And where will it all go? So Jesus is presenting that parable of the rich fool as a depiction of the opposite of wisdom. Folly. This man was thinking only about the things of this life, enjoying this life, eating, drinking, living it up, having pleasure. Whereas wisdom is the exact opposite. We're thinking about God and the things that pertain to God. As Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be given to you beside. And Jesus said this. This is what St. Ignatius used, this biblical verse, to St. Igna uh, Francis Xavier for his conversion. 
What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You gain the whole world and you lose your soul, where's it going to go? It's going to go to the government, right? And the government is going to be using it for Planned Parenthood. No? So we want to focus on, on God. So let's take uh, another one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and it's called knowledge. Knowledge is a mystical gift where we have supernatural eyes. We have supernatural eyes to see God's work behind, cre behind creation in God's work present in the activities of life. That's what knowledge is. I repeat, knowledge is a, is, is a mystical gift which gives God gives us superna supernatural eyes to look at creation, look at creation that surrounds us, but not to simply see creation in its physical mundane reality but to see but to see beyond creation the creator of all creation understand so you look at the physical creation and its beauty but you go beyond that you open up the curtains and you see that the reason for that creation itself is God, the creator of all things. One of the best biblical passages is Daniel chapter 3, in which he's praising the sun, the moon, the night, the day, the sun, the rain, the snow, the sleet. He's praising everything in creation. Daniel chapter 3, which is a very long, beautiful chapter. But not only, not only do we see, this is the gift of, of knowledge, the gift of the Holy Spirit knowledge. Not only do we see the beauty of God in creation, beyond the creation see the, the creator himself. And St. Francis was also keenly aware of this one. We have the canticle to Brother Son, one of the first Italian poems. But also we're able to see God, God's, presence in what is called divine providence. Divine providence are what happens in our lives. I've often said to my friends, I said to you, is if you want to get me angry, well, at least perturbed interiorly, say, Good luck, Father Broom. Buena suerte, Padre Escobita. Good luck, Father Broom. Buena suerte, Padre Escobita. You might say, well, why does that, why does that perturb you, Father Broom? And I'll tell you why. It is because I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in going to uh, palm readers or those who read the crystal ball or 
or horoscopes. I don't believe that. I actually believe that's against the first commandment. It's against the first commandment. In other words, the person that says good luck is relying more upon physical things and what they can do than on God, the creator of all physical things. So what is the difference between good luck and divine providence related to this gift of, of knowledge? It's simply this, that everything that happens in our lives, everything, is known and is willed by God. Even the evil that happens, God is called God's permissive will. God permits individuals because he gives them freedom to abuse their freedom rather than using their freedom to praise God, as St. Ignatius says, they use their freedom by abusing it. So God speaks, God speaks through nature and he speaks through circumstances. So behind the beauty of creation is the creator. And behind, be, uh, behind the circumstances of our lives is God working in his providential care. And we have to trust in that surrender to being a Jesus you take care of it. Jesus, I trust in you. So very much related to this gift of knowledge is a real trust in God's divine providence. These words I'm going to say to you now hopefully give you a lot of trust and a lot of peace. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his justice and everything else will be given to you beside. And Jesus says, don't worry. He says, look at the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. The lilies of the field, they don't spin. But even Solomon in all of his beautiful array is not as beautiful as the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. I've often said, did you ever see a bird flying to a psychologist to get a new prescription? Never. The bird Trust in God. God gives a bird to eat every day. So if God provides for the lily of the fields and the birds of the air, how much more us, men, of, men and women of little faith? Jesus goes on to say that he knows how many hairs we have in our head. Yesterday I got a haircut, so I've got less, I have less hair today. Jesus knows how many hairs we have on our head and even knows when one of those hairs falls to the ground. By the way, I have, I have a holy head and a holy hair because I was ordained by John Paul II. Then Jesus goes on to say, Seek, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you beside. So, as you often do when I've given my classes on the spiritual exercises, related to this gift of knowledge, 
I invite the people to think in creation, in all of God's creation, and all of God's creation is beautiful. God created everything for our happiness in this life as well as in the, in the life to come. We're called to use creation and not to abuse creation. Now, what part of creation, what element of creation, what vestige of God's presence and creation seems to captivate you most? I repeat, what part of God's marvelous tapestry, beautiful handiwork of creation seems to, to attract or captivate you most? All of this is related, my friends, to the gift of knowledge. I'm sure all of you have some image in your mind now. What is it in creation that really seems to lift your mind from this earth to the heavenly realms? What might it be? What might it be? I'll tell you something that has really captivated me over the past few years is uh, you may share this feeling with me, but I don't I don't like darkness. When I come into my room late at night, right away I turn on the lights because I don't like darkness. Darkness makes me feel sad. But I like light. Because light makes me think about God. <clears throat> light makes me think about God. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but he'll have the light of life. So one of the elements, artifacts of God's beautiful creation is the creation of the sun. When I look out at the sun, and the sun has not risen totally yet, it's kind of cloudy today in Southern California. But I look out at the sun. I know that the sun was created by God. It's God's creation. But I think it's really it's a, it's a real reflection of the beauty of God and the attributes of God. Saint Faustina Kowalska in the diary it's about number 178. She uh, says that one way we can get to know God better is to meditate upon the attributes of God. And she, um, she gives three attributes of God. First is God's absolute holiness. Our God is a holy God. Then she speaks about God's justice. That everything we do in our lives, we're going to be judged before Jesus Christ on the day of judgment. Then she mentions which... She says is God's greatest attribute, and she puts two together, God's mercy and God's love. Those are three attributes that St. Faustina says we should contemplate in trying to understand God. And I think those 
three attributes can actually be related to the whole idea of Son. Jesus is the Son of God. So how does the Son, how does the Son, at least in, in, in my experience, how does that speak to me about God? You might even ask yourselves, how does this speak to you about God? One of you, Julia, said that she really is impressed by the mountains, the majestic mountains that show the magnificence and the power of God. Going back to the sun, the sun, it rises and it reaches its peak at midday. It makes me think about every day when I celebrate the Mass, I rise or I, I elevate the host. And the host is Jesus, who is the Son of God. The host, which is Jesus, who is the light of the world. But there are many symbolic ramifications or interpretations that we can glean from the sun. The sun, I'm sure you know, is a, it's a star. It's a medium-sized star. It's basically a ball of fire. What does the sun do? In physics, we would give the sun basically two properties. The sun radiates light. And the sun radiates heat. I repeat, the sun radiates light and the sun radiates heat. So the sun is not only a symbol of Jesus, but the sun is also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Yes. As we get ready for Pentecost. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Remember Pentecost that the apostles were praying in tongues of fire descended and settled over their heads. Tongues of fire transforming them into great saints. So the sun, fire, it gives us light. It illuminates, my friends. It enlightens, it illuminates our minds, our understandings, our imagination. That's what light does. And then, not only that, but also that fire, it transforms our hearts. From thorny, hard, stony hearts, we have a gentle, loving, beautiful heart in which God wants to live. So that's one image that, that really captivates me is sun. As the sun, the sun enlightens our world and the sun gives heat to our existence. So the Holy Spirit, my friends, the Holy Spirit enlightens our minds and the Holy Spirit also sets our heart on fire with the love of God. And it makes me think, my friends, also of the Eucharist. The Eucharist that I elevate every day. As the sun is rising in the sky and reaches midday. 
So we lift up the consecrated host, which is Jesus, the Son of God. He is the light of the world. He gives light to our minds, to our intellects. He sets our hearts that can be cold at times on fire. And this can bring us to understand also the importance of Eucharistic adoration. In our church, we have adoration every day, Monday through Friday, from 1 to 6 o'clock. In our private chapel here, we have a monstrance, a monstrance in which we place the Blessed Sacrament. Monstrance comes from Latin mostra, which means to show, to show Christ. But that monstrance is made in the form of a circular form in which you can place the big host. And then you have these golden rays that are emanating from the monstrance, such that you it's almost as if you're looking at a sun the symbolic interpretation I'm giving you now. That Jesus, the Son of God, he gives us light and he gives us warmth. So some of you have pointed out mountains. Uh, Martha has pointed out the springtime in Massachusetts, the beautiful flowers. I think we all have our, our favorite. But don't stay with the creation. Allow the creation, the flowers, the sun, the morning, the mountains, whatever part of creation that really seems to captivate you, whatever. Allow that creation to lift you to, lift you to the creator. Because if it doesn't lift you to the Creator, you could be actually practicing idolatry in which you're, you're, you're adoring a physical thing. Rather, we want to allow creation to be a stepping stone to arrive at the beauty of God the Creator. So, my friends, today we have our the beginning of our Marian Consecration Course at 12 noon. We're going to be going through the message of Fatima. The children of Fatima invite you to tune in at 12 noon and to register so you can get the, uh, you, you can get the electronic uh, copies. So let's end with Mary. Let's end with a Marian brief reflection related to the Holy Spirit. In the Trinity... Mary is the daughter of God the Father. Mary is the mother of God the Son. And Mary is Mary is the mystical spouse. Mary is the mystical spouse of the Holy Spirit. So in this month of May, now we're in the Novena to the Holy Spirit. We spent time going through the gift of knowledge today. We're in the Novena now. We're in the upper room with the apostles and we're with Mary. Mary's in prayer. Mary's begging the coming of the Holy Spirit. Let's invite Mary very fervently in this month of May as we get ready for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Let's ask Mary to pray for us that we would be able to open up our hearts to the divine invasion of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with all of you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, 
and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.